Thank you, everybody. I'm going to call to order the meeting of the Municipal Audit Committee. And I believe that it was a joint meeting um, with all of the assembly members. But um, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. So here. Uh, my name is Michelle Dr Drew, and I'm the um, partner in charge for the Municipal Audit. I'm with PDO. I'm Sam Thompson. I'm also with PDO, and I work on the audit this year. Tom Kent, controller. Peter Rock, the Federal Auditor. Kate Geyard, CFO. Elby Bray Jackson. Ernie Hall. And the good news is, in terms of the audit committee, we do have a quorum here anyway, so that works. Michelle, you have a quorum. Great, thank you. Um, You're welcome. As I said, um, thank, thank you both for coming, and thank you for the folks from, from administration that are, that are here as well. Um, it's certainly my, I'm, I'm glad to be able to, to present to you. Um, and we, I want to say out of the gate, um, we, Macunda before BDO was with the municipality as the external auditor for five years. And then um, when the bid came up again, we had just transitioned to BDO. So this is our second year as BDO working with the municipality. Um, but I just want to say, you know, the last seven years we've seen some improvements and we've seen things in the controller division and we're very happy um, to be working with the municipality bank group. So we do appreciate your business. So we're going to do a little bit different this year than, than, than I've done in the past. We just have the one um, document that I'm going to kind of go through. Um, I would encourage certainly the, the two assembly members that are here um, to please ask any questions as, as they come up. If I say anything that doesn't make sense, please stop me. I would say the same is true. I'm not sure the rules of order here, but you know the same thing for at the administration. So, um, just beginning over on page two, which you know page two, um, the status of the audit. We did complete the audit. Um, it was conducted in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States. Um, the fact that we did the audit doesn't relieve management of their responsibilities. And it is clear, I, I need to make it clear, people look to the external auditors and say, well, you know, this, this is the auditor's report. But in fact, no, it's not. This is management's report. It, it was prepared by the controller division uh, and the municipal employees. And we really only own a few pages of, of the document, which is our auditor's opinion, whether they are um, um, materially correct or not. Uh, external audit is designed to provide reasonable and not absolute assurance. Absolute assurance would be impossible to achieve unless we were here full time year round. Um, over on page three, we are required to disclose to uh, those charged with governance um, certain issues about specifically how the audit was conducted. And so some of these items that I'm going to talk about briefly might seem like just a random smattering of things, but they all fall within that required communication element. So the one on page three, um, as a general rule, we received everything we wanted, everything we needed, and everything we asked for from everyone within the municipality, with one notable exception. There was some challenge getting the information associated with the angel fund activity, and specifically, um, we primarily get our information directly from controller division. So if there's a request or a question, we route it through controller division. So what had happened in this particular case, controller division themselves had difficulty getting the information regarding the angel fund specifically. The folks in charge were citing um, confidentiality agreements, and there were some third-party contractors involved in controller division this year. Um, but once it became clear that you know this this really is going to be a problem, uh, we scheduled a meeting directly with the, the angel fund folks, and then they were able to give us what we needed, and we were able to do the audit procedures. And I have a question to um, the guard. Is the uh, the angel fund staff? It was one person, correct? Yes. Is he still on board? No, he is not on board, and that was part of the challenge. We brought him back um, to help us answer these questions. We've transitioned it to both Anya Kortomsky, who's the deputy CFO, um, and Chris Richardson, who works in public finance. Anya's going to be taking more of a role, but she was new to the whole project. And so, so Anya is handling the angel She's going to handle it from this point forward, but she needed a couple months to understand it. So we kept uh, Joe Morrison on for those few months in his contract terms on June 30th. Okay. So he won't be associated with it in the future. Unless we need Thank you. Okay, then over on the next page, we did actually render um, an unmodified or a clean audit opinion on all opinion units. 
Um, there were no new accounting pronouncements in 2014 associated with the CAFR specifically. There was a new accounting rule that went into effect for the police and fire pension funds, which are reported within the, the CAFR itself um, as fiduciary funds, but the changes that were adopted on the plan side had no actual effect on the CAFR reporting. Here's a, a trivial question, okay? You use the, the word un unmodified. Is that a new term you used to say? Unqualified. Yeah. Yes, that changed a couple, two years ago, I think. Okay. But it, it does mean unqualified. It's the same same meaning, and it is clean. Yeah, a clean I, I like unmodified yeah. better than unqualified. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, and to our knowledge, no significant changes in accounting policies or practices for 2014, um, and no significant changes to assumptions used in, in building estimates. With regard to page five, adjusting journal entries, we are required to disclose to you if we made recommendations for journal entries, aka edits or corrections to the books and records. And during the audit, we, um, we, we proposed one adjusting journal entry uh, which is the one the accounts receivable revenue that management chose not to correct because it was identified somewhat late in the game um, and it would have created you know significant changes to the report. There were no other auditor uh, not no other auditor uh, proposed adjustments. However, there is one other uncorrected misstatement, which is the CIAC second that's kind of second bullet there. Um, that one has to do with the wastewater utility and has been rolling forward for about the last eight years. And this is the final year that this is gonna show up in the report and I'm so glad that that particular item is gonna go away. Um, neither of these entries is considered material and we don't believe it misstates the financial statements in any material way. But in case you should think, um, because the auditors didn't make uh, proposed adjustments that maybe we're not doing our job, um, the actual document that's prepared by management, we do go through it in quite a lot of detail, and we do make recommendations for reclassifications or footnote adjustments. So we, we are actually, I think, helping to make things better and, and cleaner, but the underlying books and records, we really don't make, we hadn't made any um, proposed adjustments to the underlying books and records. Um, over on the next page, there are a number of significant estimates that are inherent in financial reporting. I am not going to go through these in detail, but I, I just want to point out what they are. Um, the collectability of accounts receivable, in case you don't collect, could affect your income recognition. Unbilled revenues at the end of the year to the extent that you've provided services but haven't actually processed those yet. Um, the incurred but not reported self-insurance liabilities are based on date of claim, which sometimes isn't reported until after the end of the year. Over on the next page, the landfill closure liability, what it's actually going to cost the municipality 10 years out, 20 years out, when the landfill is ready to be capped and closed, what that liability is actually going to be. There are a number of regulatory liabilities connected with the water, wastewater, and um, electric utilities specifically. Um, and then there's an asset retirement obligation on the books. And I'll, I'm going to talk about that again in just a minute, but that is a pretty significant estimate as well. Um, carrying on with the estimates on page 8, um, the municipality does have a number of environmental remediation sites, and a lot of times you have to estimate what you think it's going to cost and record that liability, but sometimes, you know, um, those are based on engineers' estimates, but when it comes to it, you have to pay what it, you know, what it actually costs to remediate the item. There are a number of pension and other OPEB uh, asset and liability estimates. Um, those right now are specifically to the police and fire and not to PERS. Starting in 2015, you'll have some estimates also related to the PERS liability, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute as well. And then the, I think the last one I have on my list is the deferred credit, and this has to do with a transaction that happened in 2012 out at the port where there was essentially a, a land transfer from the uh, Air Force base to the city. And the, the city basically took responsibility for, in exchange for this piece of land, the obligation to construct a road and do some environmental monitoring. So what that's ultimately going to cost when it happens um, is yet to be determined. Over on page 9, 
We're required to disclose any significant or unusual transactions, and this year there was a restatement. Um, we did record a prior period adjustment uh, in connection with the Port of Anchorage. And basically, and, I, and I, again, I want to point out, management brought this to our attention very early in the game. They identified the problem and brought it to us. And basically, um, if you recall, that the port project was ongoing for a number of years, and then approximately 2012, the project stalled due to some construction problems out there. Um, in 2012, nothing was written off or written down, but in 2013, um, in concert with the administration and the legal department, it was determined that um, the city did have enough information to kind of go through and ferret out what was viable and what was not viable. And as a result of that, in 2013, there was an impairment write down of approximately $60 million. Now the way the municipality keeps its books and records, um, there's kind of two pieces associated with capital assets. There's the general ledger PeopleSoft, which in the, at some point in the future will be SAP. Um, and then the other part of it is an actual sub-ledger module that's specific to tracking capital assets. So in 2013, when the adjustments were made to do the impairment write down, they were booked, it was very late in the game. It, it was very late in the game in 2013. In fact, it was after year end and the entries were posted directly to the general ledger. During 2014, after the audit was wrapped up, the detailed data was actually logged into the sub-ledger, and in the process of doing that sub-ledger detailed data entry, these pieces also came to light that should have been written off at that same time. So, at any rate, as a result of this, there was a prior period adjustment. We booked, um, the city booked an entry to reduce opening net position and opening uh, construction in progress for the $6.3 million. Um, I want to put it into a context. The port alone capital asset balance is $168 million on the books. So to put it into a kind of a context. Um, we did issue a finding related to this particular transaction. Um, your internal controls are supposed to be designed to prevent and detect errors in a timely manner. And as I already mentioned, management did detect this and brought it to us, um, but we did actually issue a finding on it because that, that detection correction process wasn't timely to get it correctly reported within the right year. So. Also, I want to reiterate, despite the fact that there was a restatement and despite the fact that a finding was issued connected with that transaction, it doesn't affect the overall audit opinion, which still remains unqualified. And, and, and the thing you under, have to understand there is if management chose not to book the correction once it was identified as an error, then that would affect that. It would then be a qualified opinion if they chose not to correct it, but they did choose to correct it. Are you still on page I am. I am, sorry. Thank you. I'm kind of talking off script, yeah. but yes. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, over on page 10, um, one of your larger estimates uh, is the asset retirement obligation. Now, what is this? This is in connection with the gas field, the Beluga River unit, the, the gas field and MLNP. And as you know, um, when you issue a capital asset, um, capital assets are recorded at cost, you pay the cost, you build the item, and you place it into service and depreciate it over time. The gas field has a very significant cost associated with decommissioning and demobilization. And so it's basically the, the cost to take it down, uh, demobilize it, decommission it, and then do monitoring for some point in the future. So that is a significant estimate. It lives in ML and P's financial statements. The um, liability is about $8.1 million on the books at December 31st, 2014. In addition to that, there are cash reserves set aside to pay for that liability. Um, I believe that is pursuant to a regulatory order. Um, so there are some cash set aside, about $7.4 million. The reason this shows up here as transactions with no authoritative guidance is because there's no actual GASB government accounting rule relative to uh, ARO liability. So when this particular item was adopted, this is not new this year, this was adopted a couple few years back, uh, but when this rule was adopted, this, the city, the MLMP folks in particular, 
um, employ the provisions of what are called ASC Topic uh, 410. It's basically the for-profit accounting rules as it relates to ARO because there is no government rule associated with this. Now, I have had a conversation with the GASB, and this is on their technical agenda for the future. So at some point in the future, there likely will be an actual GASB accounting rule related to this transaction. And if and when that happens, should there be any difference uh, between the for-profit rule and the government rule, then that would be all trued up at that time, and then they would transition over to the GASB rule. So. Okay, uh, over on page 11, additional um, just items of interest. Uh, we had no disagreements with management. We're very happy to report everyone was very cooperative. Um, there were no significant changes to our original audit plan. I, I've already talked about the restatement management brought the period <coughs> adjustment to us, and we did look at that, but it didn't cause a significant change in the audit process. Um, no noted violations of laws or regulations, and no one reported to us any concerns or, or noted violations of, of laws or regulations. Um, no specialized skills outside of our core engagement team, and we are not aware of any um, management um, shopping around for accounting opinions with, with, with anyone else. Um, on page 12, significant difficulties are a required disclosure element as well. And when we really didn't have any significant deficiencies, or deficiencies, significant difficulties conducting the audit, as I believe um, the assembly is aware, uh, there were some delays in the process. We, we definitely got off to a slow start. Um, in fact, we MLMP and AWU's portion of the audit happens quite early in the game. We do field work. Uh, the end of February and first part of March. They actually, we were completed with the audit field work before they had their final number, so we were already out of the field. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but it basically did have to do with the investment reconciliation process not being fully completed uh, by the time we started the audit. Now, the bad news is we got off to a slow start. The good news is from an audit perspective, we were able to work around that, and certainly from the uh, management's perspective and controller division, they were ahead of the curve on single audit and some other task areas that we have to work on. So we were able to work around that delay without causing any additional delay on the back end. And, and I am amazed to report that our target opinion date was June 9th, and I could be opinion dated on June 10th, so, so we missed it by a day. But um, definitely within that same week, is, is, it's, it's a testimony to the hard work of everyone involved, for sure. Over on page 13, heads up. There are upcoming changes. I already mentioned police and fire implemented, uh, the pension implemented a new rule this year. Their requirement to implement that rule comes you know, in, in tandem with your requirement to implement this rule starting in 2015. And the gist of it is, the long and the short of it is, the PERS system has a multi-billion dollar unfunded liability. And the new accounting rule says every participating employer in the state is going to need to pick up their proportional share of that unfunded liability. There's quite a lot of moving parts with this in particular, and the GASB statement is, I'm going to just say crazy complicated. The actual accounting rule is very complicated, and it's going to add probably 20 pages of footnote disclosures to the already almost 200-page document, very specific to PERS and pension and how it's calculated and discount rates and actuarial information. Um, but the, the important thing to know here is the plan is that the PERS office is planning to obtain an independent audit from an, another CPA firm regarding the allocation and split, the proportional share, and if they are able to release those documents in audited form with a clean opinion, then all of the participating communities can place reliance on that information for inclusion into your own financial statements. The holdup with this is, as of today's date, the documents haven't been prepared, and there's still some legal questions surrounding the on behalf portion of the liability. Um, and to put that into some context, municipality of Anchorage in 2014, and 2014 is an outlier year because you're familiar with the $3 billion that went to the first plan that the state put into the plan. 
So um, the municipality of Anchorage share of the on behalf alone for 2014 is 57 million dollars. So when you're talking about the unfunded liability portion, it's going to be you know exponentially bigger than that. So how they're going to spread that and whether the portion that's attributable to the on behalf portion is going to get split to you or not is still being battled um, in legal channels at the state level. Now the good news for Anchorage, you're a 1231 year in. So you've still got time for them to get it sorted out. Um, we have a lot of clients who are 630 year end and they have to employ this new rule at 630 like next week. They have no numbers. So, so the good news for you is the numbers hopefully will be flushed out by the time next year's audit rolls around. The bad news for you is you, you do have still some learning curve and have to figure out how to implement this rule absent having the numbers at this time and to get all of the adjustments and there's a few decisions, policy decisions that need to be made on the Anchorage side as to where that liability is going to live. Now, to set the record straight, it will not affect the general fund. It will not affect the governmental funds in any way, shape, or form. But the rule says the full accrual statements need to record their proportional share. So a decision needs to be made whether this is going to live solely on the government-wide financial statements or whether some portion of this is going to be pushed out to any of the utilities or to any of the enterprise funds. I encourage management to, um, you know, continue educating and um, get that the policy piece figured out. Um, the other thing on page 14 that's new and upcoming is uniform administrative requirements. So this, I'm, I'm going to call it the super circular. The current rule, there's about eight separate circulars, which are OMB documents that provide regulatory guidance on federal grants management. Um, the feds have decided that eight separate circulars is too confusing, it's too disconnected, it's in too many places, and so in the last several years, they've undergone a project to come up with one comprehensive document to contain all of the rules. And that actually did go into effect. They adopted the super circular in 2013. It is effective for any grant received after December 2014. So any grant that's being received now that's a federal grant is subject to the new rules. Um, so I would again just encourage uh, Anchorage management, and I, and I was talking to Tom earlier, he said there's plans in the works to get a, a specific training session, uh, somebody brought in, because this not only affects controller division, but any of the program managers and procurement folks, your purchasing <coughs> agents as well. So even though it's in effect now for grants issued after December of 2014, some elements of it have a kind of a phase in, so there's some new audit requirements, they don't phase in for a year out or more, and the procurement rules go into effect one year later as well. So that's where the, the purchasing people really need to be as well brought up to speed as well as the program people. So we do encourage you, um, you know, whatever training you can get access to, we strongly, strongly encourage that on a positive note. So then the next, I have a, I have a number of slides that just um, kind of some trend analysis. Um, I'm not going to beat these up too much, just just some trend analysis to point out a few things uh, financially, not just how did the audit go, but financially, where, where did things land. So the first slide on page 15 um, is total net position, and net position is basically your equity <coughs> net worth at a full accrual comprehensive, uh, full accrual level, government-wide inclusive of capital assets and debt. So governmental side, um, just over $3 billion, and business type side, $755 million. Um, you know, of the just over $3 billion in equity or net worth, it's notable that roughly 85-ish percent of that equity is in the form of capital assets. So not necessarily sellable or liquid equity, but in the form of capital and infrastructure, which is used to provide essential city services. Um, over on page 16, again, here's this is that net capital assets. The capital asset balance um, 3.2 billion on the government side, and then 1.9 billion on the business type side. And your capital assets are consist of everything from land and buildings and parks and roads, uh, as well as the delivery systems for your water and sewer infrastructure, your electric distribution and generation system, the port, the uh, Merrill Field Airport, for example. So again, you know, right at the five billion dollar mark on the capital assets and infrastructure. 
Um, over on page 17, outstanding debt. The debt correlates very specifically to the capital. You use your debt program to fund your capital um, capital service. So if you have an interest, note 10, note 10 in the actual CAFR itself in the audited financial statement has detail about what makes up that debt and what the payment schedule is all about. But this is administered by the, by the finance department. Uh, over on page 18, then uh, just quickly. Michelle, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. What's the difference, because I'm not sure on it, between government activities and business tax activities? Because, for, for example, I'm going to have that outstanding debt, and for government it's 594 million, and business tax is 797 million. So the governmental activity, so the business type activities are the enterprise funds. So essentially water, sewer, electric make up the bulk of that, as well as there's some with the port and whatnot. The governmental activities on the debt side of the house is primarily roads and roads and infrastructure, primarily. Okay, okay thank you. Sure. Um, page 18 then is uh, total fund balance. And again, you can kind of see the trend if you look at 2008, that was uh, kind of the kind of the lowest point for the general fund, and, and you can see uh, an increase. You know, 2009 increased 2010, a slight increase. You know, you can see this upward trend. Um, beginning in 2013, it starts going back down again, and then for 2014, the general fund actually had a, a reduction of fund balance of 3.6 million dollars. Now keep in mind that from a budget, now we don't audit the budget, so I, you know, I don't want to get into the budget. We don't audit the budget. But this is on the gap actuals, what actually happened, fund balance reduced by 3.6. The budget actually anticipated the use of fund balance of, I think it was roughly 18 million. So, so it wasn't as much as had been uh, anticipated in the budget. Keep in mind this, this total fund balance also includes the, the MOA trust fund, the roads and drainage, and, 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 and all the other activities that are governmental related. Page 19 then is the unassigned fund um, balance. Yeah. Thank you, sorry about that. So um, the fund balance, is, do you, is, is it all funds or just the five large funds? Um, the, for, for, our, for audit purposes, the general fund is all of the 100 all funds. Okay. Not 100 funds is the general fund, um, not just the five big ones, but all the 100 funds. Okay. And then the capital project, arts, uh, uh, roads, roads and drainage, the capital project, debt service, permanent fund are in the other all governmental. So column. this is operating and capital? Yes, Sorry. operating Perfect. and capital both. Thank you. Yes. Um, same thing, uh, page 19. Uh, page 19 is the unassigned portion of fund balance. And, and for our purpose, unassigned portion of fund balance is the amount that has not already been committed to some other purpose. And it, it, there is a little bit of a, I mean, and that's, it's going to swing wildly from year to year based on a number of factors of what's in committed or non-spendable, because there are a number of other categories within fund balance. And if you want additional information, um, page 86 in the CAFR, uh, footnote 15, has a detailed breakout of what makes up the, not just the unassigned portion, but the, the assigned, committed, and restricted portion. You can see that change. So from 2013 to 2014, you can see it's about a $10 million reduction in the unassigned balance. But I, but I want to specifically point out, um, at December 31st, uh, 2014, Part of what's being reported in the assigned function is uh, uh, appropriations from the 2014, I'm going to use the word carryover, I hope I'm using that correctly, but uh, appropriations from the 2014 carryover that are assigned, and that represents about $6.4 million of, of a transfer. Okay, so this unassigned fund balance, does it include the, um, the set aside for emergencies and bond? The, the working capital reserve is in this number. The bond set aside is out. Okay. Yes. And the emergency, two to three percent, whatever that number is, it's out also? It's, it's, in, in, it's in this as well. It's in, it is? Okay. Well, so I was actually asking. So the only thing that's not included in this number is the bond reserve. The bond reserve is definitely outside of it. Yes. Okay. Yes. <coughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Um, over on page 20, tax revenues, and rather than point at the numbers, I just want to point out the percentage. So you're in, your, in the actual revenue streams, 
um, for 2014. And as you look at the trend from 2008 all the way through 2014, uh, roughly 50% of your revenue is coming uh, from taxes, which includes both the property tax as well as the other taxes are hotel, motel, uh, motor vehicle taxes, and, and tobacco taxes. So roughly 50% of your revenue stream comes from the tax base. Over on page 21, we have charges for services, and they are exactly what it sounds like, charges for services. And if you look between governmental and enterprise, you'll see a notable difference between the two, but that is to be expected because the enterprise funds, by definition, are designed to have user fees and charges um, to cover the cost of that particular operation. So on the whole, um, on the whole, you've got a roughly 30% of your revenues are coming in in the form of, of, of charges out to customers. Page 22, grants and entitlements and contributions. Um, that runs the gamut. It fluctuates from year to year, but we're in the neighborhood of 15 to roughly 18, 19%. Of, of your revenues are in the form of grants and entitlements. This is going to be an interesting, I, I have a minute, I'm going to talk about grants again in, in just a second, um, but that's going to be interesting to see where this goes given the state of the state economy and, and there's a definite trend, you'll, you'll see it in a second on the, on the federal side as well. Um, page 23 is investment income and again, um, if you look at 2008, wow, what a bad year. Um, that's when the big investment crash happened. Uh, but outside of that particular outline year, and of course 2011 was not much better, um, but across the board, you know, roughly one, two, three percent ish of the revenues are coming through in the form of investment earnings. And of these numbers, particularly the, the $12 million number that you see for governmental on the 2014 column, that does include the MOA trust fund, which made up $8.6 million of the balance. Um, page 24 are expenses, so um, just again, kind of a trend there. Uh, if you looked back at the, a few slides back when you were looking at fund balance, and 2008 was a tough year. Besides the market crash, the fund balance levels were down in that year. So, so you can see from 2008 to 2009, there was a, a kind of an expenditure reduction effort there. You can see that it went down, and then from 9 to 10, it went down again. Uh, and then, you know, then we've started um, going back up again in terms of, of expenditure activity. Again, this particular um, slide includes both um, operating and capital. And then uh, change in fund balance on page 25 uh, does just show you um, the difference. All governmental funds um, from 2013 to 2014, the governmental funds increased its total fund balance uh, by $23 million, and the enterprise funds increased by $36 million. But again, when we looked at the fund balance schedule, you know, quite a chunk of that is actually in capital, um, capital addition. So. so page 26 is the federal and state single audit slides. And you can see um, the federal grants, there's a very, very clear trend. Um, in 2008, we were kind of at the height of federal grant receipts, 66 million, and it has been, you know, basically, you know, 2010, it went back up again, but except for that one year, it's definitely trending downward. On the other side of the equation, the state expenditures, you know, again, with 2011 being kind of a weird outlying year, Otherwise, there's just a steady uptick. So the municipality has been very, very successful at generating grant revenue from the state of Alaska up to this $154 million in, in 2014. And again, it's going to be really interesting to see how this pans out going forward with the state budget being what it is. I would anticipate you know, reductions across the whole entire state with respect to grants. I would expect not to see an upward trend there going forward. And then uh, on page 27, um, for single audit purposes, um, we did select an audit um, for federal major programs this year, which was comprised of, of 50 grants, 50 individual grants. And then uh, on the state side, we actually audited 74 individual grants for major program testing for compliance, which is, but there's a huge amount of work involved in this particular piece of the audit. Um, I know um, one thing that, um, LB has pretty much asked every year, where are we at? How do we do on budget? And this particular slide 
regularly plays a role in that answer because depending on how many um, grants we have to audit, that it can cause the audit to go over scope or in additional hours or whatever, but there's no over scope charges this year. So we are on time and on budget. That's really great because it's, you know, you look at 2012, there were even two federal and then it went down and down and so it kind of balances out. Yeah, with, yes. Between federal and state and the increase in Correct. and the decrease Correct. in federal. So thank you. Yes, yes, no worries. And then um, our last page of, of this particular report is page 28 again. Um, the federal and state single audit, we did issue an unmodified opinion, again, an unqualified or clean opinion on compliance, which means we believe the municipality substantially complied with the rules of its grants and contracts on both the state and, and the federal side. And that, in relation to um, 2013 and 2012, um, if you remember, we did actually issue a qualified opinion back in 2012. And so um, that has had an effect going forward because it keeps the municipality in kind of a high risk status, that qualified opinion from 2012. That should have been rotating off, but when we move down to the next bullet, the government auditing standards um, finding, um, there was, as I already talked about, we did issue a material weakness finding associated with the restatement on the port. Again, the internal controls did catch the problem, but they didn't catch them in a timely manner for that transaction to be properly reported in the correct year. So as a result of that, we did issue the material weakness finding. And then um, the last finding here is what we call the significant deficiency finding was the reconciliation of investments. And, and I just want to briefly touch on procedurally, because I don't want anyone to walk away saying the municipality didn't reconcile cash all year. That's not accurate at all. They, the cash in the bank accounts were reconciled all year. And in fact, the investment activities were being recorded, the investment statements come in, and they were in fact being recorded all year. But the municipality's own process is to perform something called a, a three-way reconciliation. And so the statements come in to public finance. Public finance enters the data into a software system called Simpro. Simpro spits out a journal entry that's transmitted to controller division to be entered into PeopleSoft. So the requirement and where the internal control meltdown happened was in the process of this requirement for a three-way reconciliation. So even though the statements came in and got entered to Simpro, Simpro spits the journal entry and enters to PeopleSoft. From the statements back to PeopleSoft is the three-way reconciliation. And that's the piece that did not happen. And that's the piece that basically caused the delay at the outset because because there was basically a lot of months the whole year basically needed to be have that, that second piece performed. So we did report Can you that as for a moment. Yes. Um I'm sorry. Can you tell us what happened? We had a long term staff and controller that moved to public finance. Um, very highly regarded staff, but she didn't know that that was part of her job that she should have been doing on a regular basis. So that was a breakdown in writing you know, desk procedures, so she would have known that. So at the end of the year, it was discovered that she hadn't done it all year long. So um, public finance has now written desk procedures and put policies in place to review that work on an ongoing basis. Um, with respect to the actual grants themselves, we issued no findings. So um, there were no findings related to federal grants and no findings related to the state grants. And I, I put the prior few years on there. So again, you can see in relation to, to prior year performance, there was one federal finding in 2013, two in 2012, three in 2011, five in, so you can, you can actually see some notable improvement going on there. So that was my last slide. We we're about 15 minutes before 12. I'm happy to try to answer any questions or does anybody have any questions? I really like this form. Oh, thank you. Very easy to follow. I have to agree um, with Paul. I really like the format. Um, I think there's a little bit of extra information that's provided in the center, and I really like that. And I just want to take a moment and say, um, first off, um, the Ms. Gar staff for um, working so well as usual with, with the internal auditors. And I also want to thank the internal auditors for doing a really good job and also for um, making sure that the Budget Finance Committee got the updates because I read every single one of them and I really appreciated um, receiving those. And um, another audit done virtually on time and um, I appreciate that so thank you all for doing great work. Any other comments? 
So I think we just owe a round of applause to the accountants who are in the back. Right. Right. Do you want to make any comments? Uh, it's okay. Well, I would like to say that I was very impressed with the controller division as a whole. I mean, everybody stepped up the second year. We, we called it a, uh, like a Christmas miracle because it, it was tough. We had people working long hours and continuous days, and and I just want to uh, thank the whole staff, the controller division, and Ellis assistant controller. Right, but I know Kim, and just, you know, overall, thank you all for your service to the citizens of Anchorage. That's all I want to thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.